when I was um, an undergrad, I was a drama major. Okay. So I majored in theater, okay. but only for a year. <laughs> because at, uh, at Chapel Hill, at University of North Carolina, um, the theater department also had Playmakers Repertory Company, so they had an MFA program in acting. Okay. So undergraduates weren't cast in the shows, and I wanted to perform. Mm -hmm. And so um, I became a work-study student in the Department of Speech Communication and fell into this thing called oral interpretation, where they were doing shows all the time, and they didn't have a PhD program. Um, so undergraduates were in all of the shows. Okay. So that's how I sort of fell into Well, as I recall in high school, I actually did that competitively. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm wondering if, if you did it competitively in college? Or I didn't do. They called it, um, as a part of many uh, debate teams in forensics, um, it was called IE, Individual Events, and you had to have the book. The, 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 the script was uh, a part of um, the competition. I don't know if that was true when you were. I think it was. Yeah. I, I'm not, I can't memorize anything anyway, so it had to be. But. <laughs> and the, the funny thing is, a lot of people that, that did um, uh, forensics, they had already memorized it. The book was just a prop. Um, but um, no, I didn't do it competitively. I only did it in a classroom setting. And then when um, professors would adapt short stories and novels for the stage, I was in those as well. And I also, um, in undergrad, uh, was in a lot of um, what's now known as documentary theater, like um, have you seen the Laramie Project or heard about mm -hmm. the Laramie Project, where oral histories are adapted um, for the stage. And the first um, production I was in was called Like a Family, um, which was based on the oral histories of cotton mill workers in North Carolina. And uh, one of my professors uh, adapted um, those oral histories for the stage. And we toured um, North Carolina. We went back to the cotton mills and performed for the people who those stories were based on. And um, that really was my first entree into taking real life stories and adapting them for the stage. My master's work was really what got me into oral histories because my, oral, my MA thesis was on my grandmother and so was my dissertation. Hmm. My um, grandmother was a live-in domestic for 18 years, okay. um, and she started working for this family in 1955 and worked until 1972 or three. And um, so I Thinking, you know, wow, how wonderful. 
wonderful it would have been for someone like me when you know I was coming to terms with being gay if I had had these stories yeah. to know that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't the only one that had gone through this. So I decided, being the coachiest person that I am, that when I got the time and energy and resources that I was going to come back and do it myself. Mm -hmm. I was going to record these stories. So it took me a while, but in 2004, got a sabbatical from Northwestern and a small little grant, when I say small, it was really small, $5,000, and um, traveled back here to the South and traveled to 15 different states and started collecting these oral histories. And I interviewed 77 men, 63 made the book, the youngest was 19, the oldest was 93. So the, the show is based One difference, my story is included. Um, in the earlier versions of the performances of Sweet Tea, there, there's a version of the show called Pouring Tea, Black Gay Men of the South Tell Their Tales. And have any of you seen the vagina monologues? I heard about the vagina mm -hmm. monologues. So it was the vagina monologues version <laughs> of Sweet Tea. Simply me sitting on a stool with a music stand, reading the story giving you a little bit of the voice and also playing an excerpt from the original interview so that you heard their voice before I went into their voice. Um, and so I've done that version uh, at over 80 colleges and universities around the country since 2006. Then Sweet Tea, the stage play, um, premiered in Chicago last spring. And Jane, the producer, and other uh, artists that I workshop the show with really encouraged me to include my stories of growing up in the South as well. But in that version in Chicago, my stories were mixed in, but they didn't frame the entire play. That happened in the process of, of writing the show here. And it was really interesting for me as a playwright to um, be forced to tell stories that I didn't really want to tell about myself, um, stories that um, I was still processing and coming to terms with. But um, I'm glad I was forced to do it, and it has made me appreciate the um, uh, incredible strength and courage it took for these men to tell me their stories. So I feel it's only fair that I was forced to make myself as vulnerable as they made themselves to me. You were writing the plays. How did you find all these people, these interviewers, or interviewers? Where did you find all these men? Um, initially, I started with people that I knew uh, in North Carolina, particularly in um, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, where I went to school. The people I still knew there, and Atlanta, where I had friends. And um, then it was literally a snowball effect. People started telling people, who tell people, who tell people, and it got to a point to where people were contacting me, saying, I want to tell my story. Wow. And uh, I had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> After two years of doing this, I, I literally had to stop doing the oral histories because, I, you know, I, I had 3,000 pages. Mm. And the first version of this book was 1,000 pages. How long was it done? 600. <laughs> Where did you find the Countess? I was interviewing a, a gentleman by the name of Ed in uh, New Orleans, uh, who somebody else had told me about. And um, after our interview, he said, you have to meet the Countess. And I said, who is the Countess? <laughs> he says, oh, the Countess is the mother of New Orleans. And um, he said, Countess is is in his 90s. I don't actually know how old he is. He's in his 90s. But you must talk to the Countess. He was just the most adorable, welcoming person. Um, as soon as I met him, he said, hey, baby, come on in, sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just sort of just telling me this story about his life growing up, um, you know, really coming of age in the 20s, and um, about prohibition. 
exhibition. Oh, it's just an incredible, vibrant history there in New Orleans. Um, and also segregation, racial segregation being divided by railroad. He talked about there being this um, really vibrant black gay community um, in this one section of New Orleans called the district. And these tranny hookers um, getting white patrons and then stealing their money. Um, and I mean, just incredible stories. One of the most really, um, I think it was divine intervention, really. And I interviewed Countess in uh, January of 2005. We know in August of 2005, Katrina hit. Mm -hmm. And I lost touch with him. And I thought for sure he'd perish in Katrina. And I would do these searches online on opits.com and on missing persons um, to try to find, find him. 2009, I received an email from my publisher you know, that was forwarded from them to me from this man in um, Oakland, California, named Saunders Willis. Saunders had gone to Barnes and Noble to buy a Bible and then said, oh, let's see what's in the gay and lesbian section. <laughs> I love that segment. <laughs> <laughs> Saw um, Sweet Tea, the hardcover, lying face down. And again, on the hardcover, the back jacket has a picture of Countess Vivian standing in his uh, doorway in New Orleans. And he said, that looks like Mr. George. So he picks up the book and he says, that is Mr. George. Flips through the book to find his story. And at the beginning of his story, not in the paperback, this has been updated, but in the hardcover, I say, I haven't been able to find um, Countess since Katrina. And he says, oh, I have to get in touch with him. I know how to get in touch with him. I have to find Professor Johnson. So he emailed my publisher and said, Please get this email to Professor Johnson. I know George Everson, a.k.a. Countess Vivian, and I can put him in touch with him. So when they forwarded me um, Saunders' email, I got in touch with him. He gave me the Countess's number. I called the Countess. He picked up the phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was such a, I was just like screaming. I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And so the funny thing is, so I, yeah, I'm telling Countess, oh, I've been looking for you. And all of a sudden he says, oh, yeah, baby, I got the book. My friend sent it to me way, 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 way long ago. <laughs> um, and so I wondered how you knew all that stuff about me, but I guess I told you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>